Hi, everyone. Welcome to the July HR02 podcast. I'm Jeannie Poole, the Editor-in-Chief. We have a great lineup of interesting articles for the July issue. The first paper is titled Prevalence and Management of Electrical Lead Abnormalities in Cardiac Implantable Electronic Device Leads by Hilary Roberts and colleagues. This paper addresses the ever-important issue of electrical lead abnormalities in CIEDs. We know that the occurrence of such lead abnormalities lead to replacement, removal, and extraction procedures, which are all associated with some risk. The authors present the results of a retrospective cohort study of patients implanted with a CIED between 2012 and 2019 at a single tertiary care center. An electrical lead abnormality was defined as a sudden change, either up or down, of the impedance by 50% over three months, or sensing of non-physiologic potentials, third, Decreased sensitivity with a change in the value of equal to or less than 0.5 of the implantation value. Fourth, an increased capture threshold compared to an implantation value two times or greater the implant value. Important exclusions to this analysis included, first, lead dislodgements occurring within 90 days of implant, or two, header block issues discovered at the time of pocket reentry for suspected electrical lead abnormalities. The cohort included 2,996 unique patients with 4,600 leads. The lead manufacturer was Abbott in 57% and Mentronic in 43%. Out of the 2,996 patients, electrical lead abnormalities were identified in 135 patients or 3% of the leads over a follow-up of 4.5 years. 92% were Abbott leads and 7% were Medtronic leads and this difference was significant. Lead revision was required in 28% of the cases. Patients with lead abnormalities had 38% more in-clinic visits per patient year of follow-up compared with those without. On multivariate analysis, variables that were associated with electrical lead abnormality included chamber location, that is atrial over ventricular, with a hazard ratio of 1.68, and Abbott leads with a hazard ratio of 10.44 compared to the Medtronic leads. The authors note that lead fringe size, passive versus active fixation, and chamber location were highly correlated, and that only lead fringe size and chamber location were kept in the multivariate model. When pacing leads were looked at alone, the risk of electrical lead abnormality was associated with atrial lead location. Further contemporary studies, including all manufacturers and types of leads, would be useful to support these data. The next study is titled Frame Rate Reduction to Reduce Radiation Dose for Cardiac Device Implantation is Safe by Dr. Fabian Bork and colleagues. This paper focuses on the known radiation exposure risk to the patient, the operators, and the team during CIED procedures. The authors suggest that a low effort modification is to use reduced frame rate fluoroscopy. These authors started to use a 3.8 frame per second frame rate compared to what they had used prior, which was 7.5 frames per second. They then compared the 264 patients with the reduced frame rate to the 231 patients prior to when the change was made. The type of devices included 17% single chamber, 63% dual chamber, and 19% CRT. The primary endpoint for the comparison was incidence of complications, The secondary endpoints were radiation dose and procedural parameters. The next paper is titled Intracranial Bleeding and Associated Outcomes in Atrial Fibrillation Patients Undergoing Percutaneous Left Atrial Appendage Occlusion. Insights from the National Inpatient Sample 2016 to 2020. This paper is written by Drs. Muhammad Khan and colleagues. The study uses the National Inpatient Sample and International Classification Diseases, or ICD-10 codes, to identify patients who underwent left atrial appendage occlusion between 2016 and 2020 who had a prior history of an intracranial hemorrhage, as these patients were excluded from the clinical trials. The outcome measures were complications in hospital mortality in resource utilization. A total of 89,300 left atrial appendage occlusion device implantations were included. 565 of these, or 0.6%, occurred in patients with a prior history of an intracranial bleed. This data set did not have information on the antiplatelet or anticoagulation strategy used prior and after the implantation of the LAAO device. 
The authors identified that a history of intracranial bleeding was associated with a higher prevalence of overall complications and inpatient mortality in crude analysis. In a multivariate model adjusted for potential confounders, intracranial bleeding was found to be independently associated with higher inpatient mortality, adjusted odds ratio 4.27, higher overall complications, adjusted odds ratio 1.74, and an increased cost of hospitalization with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.28. The authors note that there is, is a randomized clinical trial ongoing now which will help to further understand the higher risk in this patient population. That trial is called the Clearance Trial, which stands for Comparison of LAA Closure versus Oral Anticoagulation in Patients with Nonfabular Atrial Fibrillation and Status Post Intracranial Bleeding. Next up is a paper titled Optimal Conditions for High Power Short Duration Radial Frequency Ablation Using a Novel Flexible Tipped Force Sensing Catheter. This is an animal study that seeks to determine the optimal high power short duration ablation conditions with a novel flexible tipped contact force sensing RFA catheter. The effective range of input parameters studied that were tested in this multi-step study were first the target RF powers between 51 and 90 watts, target forces between 2 and 40 grams, irrigation rates between 8 and 40 milliliters per minute, temperature limits between 40 and 65 centigrade, and finally ramp rates of 2 seconds, 6 seconds, and then auto. The first step was a bovine RV bench tissue study. Here the objective was to determine thresholds for steam pop occurrences and assess the efficacy of the lesion formation. Step 2 used 16 swine thigh muscle preparations to also assess thresholds for steam pops and coagulation formation. Step 3 was an in vivo safety study in 12 swine for the purpose of characterizing thresholds for steam pops. And step 4, or the final study, was also an in vivo study in 14 swine to identify the optimal parameters and efficacy of lesion formation. The results are summarized in the author's key findings. First, safe and effective high power short duration lesions can be created using a novel flexible tipped force sensing radio frequency irrigated ablation catheter. Second, contact force had a greater impact on safety and efficacy with high power short duration radio frequency ablation compared with conventional ablation. And third, optimal safety and efficacy with high power and short duration with a flexible tipped force sensing catheter was created at 60 to 70 watts for 8 seconds with 15 grams of contact force. The next paper title is Design and Rationale of the Modular ATP Global Clinical Trial a novel intercommunicative leadless pacing system, and the subcutaneous implantable cardioverter defibrillator by Michael Lloyd and colleagues. As most of you know, Boston Scientific is currently conducting its IDE trial for FDA approval. Using their standard SICD and their empowered leadless pacemaker, this trial is enrolling up to 300 patients with a standard indication for an ICD. Patients will either already have an SICD but require single chamber pacing or ATP capability, or can receive a new SICD implant along with the empowered leadless pacemaker. This is a modular system that provides for commanded ATP to be delivered for detected ventricular tachycardia. The safety endpoint is freedom from major complications related to the modular CRM system or the implantation procedure at six months and two years which will be significantly better than the performance targets of 86 and 81% respectively, and that all-cause survival is significantly better than 85% at two years. This trial is well underway, and we anticipate and look forward to the results. The next paper in the lineup is a review topic titled The Electrophysiology of Electrocution. This is really a unique topic, so I encourage you all to read it. It is authored by Dr. Mark Kroll and colleagues. The next paper is a case report. The title is A Case of Safe and Durable Focal Pulsed Field Electroporation Treatment of Outflow Tract Premature Ventricular Contractions. First author is Dr. Renee Wark. The background for this case report is the growing body of literature demonstrating the safety and effectiveness of pulsed field electroporation for atrial fibrillation and other atrial arrhythmias. Less data is available exploring the use of PFE for ventricular arrhythmias. These authors used focal PFE to approach a patient with frequent PVCs of right ventricular outflow tract origin. Focal PFE was coupled to a force-sensitive catheter, 
and as guided by 3D electrical anatomic mapping. Continuous ice imaging was used throughout the procedure. After the PVC origin was mapped on the endocardium, focal PFE lesions were applied. The authors delivered seven total cura synchronized ablations with between 19 and 22 amps and between 4 and 7 seconds. Contact force was between 8 to 18 grams. Catheter irrigation was maintained at 4 milliliters per minute. No bubble bursts occurred or other acute discernible complications, and the patient remained free of symptomatic PVCs at the two-month follow-up visit. The authors conclude that safe and durable eradication of PVCs originating in the ventricular outflow tract was feasible using focused PFE. The final paper is a brief report. The title is Site-Specific Prolongation of Repolarization Prevents Postmyocardial Infarction Tachycardia by Ryan O'Hara and colleagues. The authors discuss the results of a study that is performed in a swine model. The background for this study is that antiarrhythmic drugs prolong refractoriness by reducing repolarizing currents and are frequently used to prevent post-MIVT. The current medications, however, may prolong the action potential duration throughout the cardiac cycle, including areas that the action potential is already prolonged in, and that this situation might promote polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. For their study, they created an LAD occlusion in the swine. Six weeks later, they performed epicardial mapping program stimulation to induce monomorphic VT. Then they injected 0.5 milliliters of sotalol at the site where fractionated electrograms were identified in order to prolong repolarization. No ST elevation occurred due to the injection, and the epicardial activation sequences were not altered. PES was performed 15 minutes after the injection, and they could no longer induce ventricular tachycardia. The second part of their experiment was to use a digital twin heart model from a patient with postmyocardial infarction arrhythmias, pre-ablation enhanced MRI imaging, gray zone myocardium with remodeled ionic current properties, and slowed conduction. Core scar was made inexcitable. The excess side of induced VT was identified, and then they prolonged the repolarization by 50 milliseconds in the non-scarred myocardium and performed programmed electrical stimulation, and no VT could be induced. These findings show the potential of target repolarization that can be site-specific. This could be accomplished with, for instance, a bioresorbable adhesive device or using cardiac gene therapy. These are interesting findings and we can look forward to more studies from this group of investigators. Well, thank you for your attention. That wraps up the July 2023 HRO2 podcast. We'll talk to you again next month.